Okay, so yeah. Joanna, we want to talk today about success in school and what does your child's teacher need to know um, basically at diagnosis, during treatment, and um, after diagnosis. And we want to ensure success during and after a cancer diagnosis. So there's us. Okay, so basically these are the four points that we're going to try and cover today. <clears throat> how to communicate effectively with your child's school. That's that's most important is the communication piece. Um, what information needs to be shared and what does the teacher need to know? And that's also very important. <clears throat> and what does your child need to be successful in school? And what realistically to expect from the school uh, in this process? Um, We'll jump right in. A good relation, as this slide says, a good relationship begins with good communication. So developing a relationship with the school, with the school team, with the teacher, um, it makes communicating much easier. Um, and we need we need you to really see yourself as a partner with the school. Um, so the best relationship is as a partnership. Uh, if you consider yourself part of the child's team at school kind of like you do with the medical team at the hospital, um, you are uh, ensured to be part of the process, as to inform the process, and also to make sure that uh, your needs and your child's needs are at least expressed. Teachers, uh, teachers know uh, that you know a lot about your child, okay? And you know your child best. Um, and so between yourself and the teacher, we literally have a common goal, and that is student success. Um, teachers want your child to do well at school. They want all children to do well at school, and you want your child to do well at school. So together, there's your relationship, your common goal that brings you together. So we just um, saw this visual that effective communication is meaningful conversation. And, and um, I think as a school representative, uh, both of us have sort of worked in schools our whole career, that um, effective communication and makes meaningful conversation. And um, I think that the school, sometimes it can feel like um, the school is sort of out there and we're sending kids to them, but really um, there's lots of ways to be involved even day to day and to make sure that you have that voice and that your child is represented really well in the process. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the A word. <laughs> so advocacy. Advocacy. Uh, some of you might have actually thought that this presentation was about advocating, um, but um, we started with communication and relationship. So how does advocacy relate to communication and rela relationship? Um, again, um, in, in, this, in, the, uh, in the dyad between uh, yourself and the school, um, everyone, as we said, everyone's interested in the child's success. Um, but we have to remember also that uh, no one in the relationship is totally neutral. Uh, you have your perspective, um, you have your real, your reality, uh, you have the other factors that might be influencing uh, how you feel about the school and how the school feels about you. There's there's um, a perspective, um, and so um, the most important thing is to know that if you are looking to be effective in that communication and meaningful in that communication, you need to come together. Um, this little slide is kind of interesting, um, we hope, um, <laughs> because advocacy is often seen as such um, a negative thing. So let's talk about what is opposite to, ad to, to being an advocate. And you can see all those words there, oppositional, antagonistic, um, rejecting, attacking, all of those things. But we need to talk about what advocacy is not. And so just thinking about some of those terms, if that's not what an advocate is or advocacy is, then what is advocacy? Um, think about the word ally. An advocate is an ally, not an opponent. An advocate is a person of cooperation. An advocacy is cooperation and partnership, not oppositional or antagonistic. Um, advocacy is about being collaborative and solving problems together not rejecting and attacking each other's ideas. And it is not critical. It is all about communication, which is, again, brings us back to sort of our focus today is being, being a communicator with your school uh, in order to help the school support your child. 
advocacy is not adversarial, please. We really wanted to focus on um, building relationships with the school. And so we know that this is really, um, really big work that um, you're already dealing with um, the medical field and a lot of unknowns and a lot of new things there. Um, but this is an opportunity to work alongside educators, work alongside the school and make sure that we're able to set up the best environment for, for kids as they're going through something that we know is, is also uh, perhaps a bit um, scary for them. And it's definitely new and it's definitely um, not something that every student in the class is going through. And so we want to make sure that we set you up to build those relationships and work on those relationships and um, that you have an opportunity to plan and get ready for working with the school in a way that's going to move this work forward so that you're prepared with information about your child with questions for the team and um, with things that you can provide from home and things they can offer at the school as well as that you are um, prepared to book time to meet with the team and that um, you're, it's okay to be authentic. So this is emotional work and that it's okay to show your emotion when you're speaking about your child, obviously. Um, we, the school knows this is big work and you don't need to hide that from the school or feel like they shouldn't see that part of this process because I think it's important that, that the school see um, where you are in this journey and where the, where the child is in the journey for sure. Um, I think that, you know, at the base of all of this is a respectful and, um, you know, cooperative relationship, and we hope that these things set that up. Um, all right, talking about diagnostic stage. So, as the slide says, research has shown that open communication between the school, parents, and child with cancer can lessen the effects of cancer on a child's education. Um, so, you you probably all experience how this is um changed how education is happening for your child, but uh, you can lessen the effects by, uh, by being a cooperative sh information sharer with the school. Um, we would suggest that you inform the school about the diagnosis as soon as possible. Don't hold back and, and uh, think that uh, they don't want to know or they shouldn't know. In fact, uh, they, they, they need to know. Um, Provide details of the, the treatment plan if you what what you know how long you know the timelines that have, that you've been given share what you know um, so that nobody's speculating um, if you know for example that the child is going to be missing a few days a week or a whole week or maybe months share that because that again will help with the planning process of how the school can continue to support your child. Um, make a commitment to keeping the, the, t the teacher uh, informed and those communication lines open. Um, might seem like one more person that you have to explain a lot of stuff to, but it really is, it really is about keeping the school part as part of the partnership um, in this whole process for you and your child. Um, you, um, one of the things that it, many people have found uh, helpful is uh, to connect with Kids Cancer Care and uh, have them, they've got a beautiful presentation um, for uh, aimed at children at school. And if you can offer to have that presentation presented to your child's classroom in cooperation with the teacher, um, that can be very, very helpful, not only for the teacher, but for the other children, uh, the peers um, and the friends of your child um, to help allay, uh, allay any of the fears that they may have uh, as this scary word sort of comes into their into their life. Um, information takes the mystery and the fear uh, out of the mind for both the teaching team and the classroom. So um, let's set that initial stage. I'm going to just toss in a practical, a practical suggestion that um, email is probably your best friend in this instance, that keeping school informed. Um, it saves you the time of having to, to phone individual people and an email can easily be passed along. So if, if, for example, you send an email to a school administrator, that administrator can let teachers and support staff that are maybe involved in your child's education know fairly quickly. It also um, has that, you know, we can look back. So sometimes we can't get to it right away and um, we'll be able to sort of file that and be able to reference it later when, when we're um, dealing with immediate situations. And that, that seems like a silly suggestion, but I think um, sometimes it feels like you need to phone people and talk to them about it, but it's just 
fine to send an email. And I think in a lot of ways it's, it's preferred. It also allows you to go into your sent folder and say, I know I've described this once before and just copy and paste and not have to re explain things or retype things over and over and over again. So when you get past treatment stage and you're thinking about returning to school, um, it's, it's important to know that when teachers know what the child is going through, they can do a better job of supporting your child. So start planning early to create a re-entry plan. Um, meet with the school and again, you know, set up a meeting in person or, or a Zoom meeting these days. Um, even, even just to let the, the teacher know sort of when your child is coming back to school, what they're going to be facing when they come back to school. Um, provide details of the child's new normal uh, and the general health status. And I think it's really important to emphasize, and I think this is probably true for every child, that they want to be treated and seen as normally as possible. They don't want to be made the center of, of, of attention um, related to their medical history. Um, and I, I think it's important to, um, as you're thinking about re-entry re to school, to think about personalized and perhaps unique solutions. I think when we all think of our own educational experience, it was you go to school or you're at home. And um, in this day and age, and um, this may be, I don't want to say that the pandemic is a good thing, but there are good things that are going to come out of, out of this, and that schools are building and um, resourcing more unique solutions all the time. So schools can work with you to create a modified schedule where the student only comes part of the day or even comes certain days of the week. The school is equipped to offer some home learning in conjunction with face-to-face -face learning, uh, not just during COVID times. That is something that we can offer on an ongoing basis. There's also the opportunity of your, maybe your child not attending um, for some days, but being able to have a phone or, or a Google or uh, one, a Zoom meeting with a teacher um, per, to personalize and, and keep in touch with the classroom and feel connected to the school. So don't shy away from suggesting unique solutions and don't think that it's they're there every day or not at all. There's lots of pieces in between and lots of ways to personalize this for your child. And it's okay to ask for that and to look for those solutions. So when it comes to what to tell the school at this stage, um, the whole issue of medications, um, if, if the child is taking medications, and likely they are, um, what, uh, what are the effects of the medications that the teacher might see a different kind of child when they come back to school and how much of that is about the medications and that, and that knowledge will help her, her, him or her understand the child better. Um, and if there's medications that are required at school, um, what are they and how does the school want that handled? Um, every school has a protocol about um, administering medications at school, so you'll need to make sure that that's cleared up. Um, is your child coming back to school with special devices or accommodations, like, like accessibility issues, um, a wheelchair or a walker or even a cane? Again, these are all possibilities, and uh, what, what the teacher needs to do to accommodate that um, is best planned ahead of time. Um, and then there's a whole piece about emergency management. Um, it is really important to provide to the teacher a list of signs and symptoms that she or he should be looking for um, in your child that might indicate something is needing attention. Um, the, the, important, uh, the important things that need to be report, reported to the parents and the possible uh, problems and symptoms that are specific to your child. This is not general, this is about your child specifically. You don't want to frighten the school staff with all of this information, but the reality is that the more the teacher knows, the more he or she will be, be comfortable in knowing how to support your child effectively. Um, make sure the school has a list of contact information updated and current, um, who to call, um, special precautions that are that are required that, that you need to know about um, for example if there's a chicken pox or measles outbreak in the school i mean th those kinds of things are particularly important as you know and so the school needs to know that that uh, that is of prime importance to yourself um, it's important to everyone but especially important to a child a post-cancer treatment 
And then there's the physical considerations that um, the, the teacher might see. Um, is your child more fatigued? And how do we how do we manage that fatigue factor? Um, a lot of kids will come because of medication effects uh, with dry mouth. So um, and many teachers are allowing kids to have water, but if that's not the case in your in your child's classroom, uh, make sure that uh, the teacher knows that the child needs access to water all the time, or perhaps um, um, more um, a more open bathroom pass uh, because of more frequent uh, frequent need to use the bathroom. Um, also, um, there's some kids will need more frequent snacks, and so how do um, the teacher can manage that again without being disruptive, but also honoring the child's needs. So those are those are very important, really care care pieces that uh, the teacher needs to know about uh, that are really specific to your child. So we also wanted to attend to the emotional consider considerations of return to school. We know that um, returning to school, if even after a short absence or a lengthy absence, um, is exciting, but also perhaps a difficult stage from time to time. And so we want to make sure that um, you feel open to share your concerns and worries about returning to school. And so, you know, what, what are some anxieties that maybe your child has shared and what are some worries that they might have that when the teacher knows those things, they're better equipped to address them, uh, you know, in a way that is honors the child and gives that privacy, um, and, but also to celebrate successes. So, you know, after that first date, feel free to celebrate that and, and uh, celebrate that they, you know, did well on a math test or that they stayed for the whole day, that kind of thing. Another thing I like to point out as an educator is to prepare for tough days. So, um, Every, not everything's going to go great every day. I think 2020 has definitely taught us that, that there will be some tough times and that when students have a tough day at school, that we can honor that and recognize that with them. But then well, the way we move on from there is really important. So when students have better skills for the next time or when the school is better prepared, it builds resiliency in everyone involved. And we want students to know that even if they had a tough day or something went wrong at school, maybe they got sick there, that, you know, the next time, if maybe things didn't go well, or even if they did go really well, that we're going to try it again, and we're going to continue to um, go to school and work on these things. Schools are learning places, and everyone in them is, is there to learn, and that we're going to have tough days, but we're going to get up and dust ourselves off and carry on the best we can. All right, so some academic considerations for a return to school. So um, with certain cancer diagnosis, um, Alberta Health Services will ask for an academic assessment. So in an academic assessment, they're going to look for, they're going to do these tests called Wyatts and WISCs and BASCs. And what they're looking for is any discrepancy between a student's achievement, so where they're currently achieving, and uh, basically where their potential lies. And they're going to look for things like changes in learning, so sometimes with brain tumors, they'll do a pre-assessment and then they'll do an assessment after surgery or after treatment and then longer down the road. With other cancers, they do assessments at the end of treatment. That's really something that you work out with your medical team. But it's really important that that assessment get in the hands of the school and the teachers involved. What the school will do is they'll put that on file and then they'll work to do something called coding. Now this has changed slightly in Alberta. Codes, um, they have numbers attached and, and everything. Coding used to be attached with funding and it's a little different now. So the funding model doesn't have, um, isn't quite attached to codes in the same way that it was, but it is still important that if your child should have a code, an educational code, that that's still indicated in their file. And truthfully, every child diagnosed with cancer probably should have the medical code attached because cancer is definitely going to impact their education, their ability to access school, and um, the way they can interact with their, with their teachers and things. And so that should be shared with the school so they can add that coding. What the coding is going to generate is an IPP or an individual program plan. And I like to say that the magic of the IPP isn't just in the piece of paper. It's in the intention behind uh, what 
what educators and families put in that IPP. So what are, we start with the strengths. So where are our strengths in, in this student and where are they finding success? And how can we leverage that to support them in any areas where they might be discovering or in, encountering new difficulties or even ongoing difficulties? And so through that IPP, we would set up some goals and work towards things that we know that we want the student to find new successes in or find growth in. And what's important there is that we look for our current level of performance and we need that to be really accurate. So sometimes that academic assessment can be two, three, even five years old. It's very rare that academic assessments are redone once children are stabilized into their education program. So if you have an academic assessment, um, even for someone who didn't experience cancer, if that academic assessment is five years old, unless we're seeing really significant differences in that from what's going on in school, it probably won't change and so they very rarely redo them. But current level of performance allows us to say, oh, okay, well, let's look at where we are in reading, where are the gaps and then address those specific gaps. And so you can support the school by even giving them current level of performance at home. So maybe you're starting to see some self-regulation issues, Stu children who um, aren't able to control their emotions or even their anger um, quite as well as they were before. Communicate that with the school. That gives them the current level of performance with self-regulation and allows the school to address that through the IPP, through goal setting and through some strategy teaching. Um, and then identify goals with the school. So if you have specific goals, if you're seeing things like uh, disorganization or the ability to get out the door in the morning with everything they have on, um, that's an executive functioning goal that if you're seeing it at home, you're probably the teacher's probably seeing it at school. So identify the goals that you have for your child. And most of the time, the school has seen those same things and they want to work with you. And so we get into developing the IPP. And before you do that, can yeah. I just say that an IPP um, typically is, is oh, academic goals. Okay, a child has got academic issues, and so we develop some, some um, strategies and goals that relate to improving their academics. However, an IPP can also be medical, and that's where some of those things we talked about earlier um, are, are documented, so that they are in part of you know, part of the day-to-day -day, uh, reality of the child. So some of those medical considerations can be in a medical IPP, um, as well as a behavioral IPP, as well as an academic IPP. And sometimes it involves all three. So, but just so you know that it's, it, uh, you know, when we think about an IPP, it covers the whole child and what they need, not just one aspect of that. Awesome. Thanks, Joanne. Yes, yeah, sometimes a medical IPP can just be a goal about how often the student accesses online resources while they're away and get them used to that that type of interaction exactly. and, and that sort of thing. Awesome. So um, the IPP process, um, and I think this goes back to the advocacy. I think sometimes we think of the IPP process as, as, as a really big task and really all it is is a formalized plan with intention. And so um, I always like to draw us back to make sure the IPP is student centered and that it's all, it's about what the student needs, what the student wants. In every IPP process, as educators, we sit down with the student and ask them what they need. And that, that might seem um, daunting for a seven-year-old, but um, you'd be impressed with how insightful they are about their own education and the things they want at school. So, I mean, I've sat down with a six-year-old and say, what do you want at school? And they will say, I want to be able to read out loud better. They, they recognize that that's an area where they may be struggling. And so we can write a goal that's student-centered and based on um, things that they know they need as well as things that we recognize. Of course, a child probably doesn't have a, a big understanding of what their educational assessment says, but they definitely have an emotional t connection to their learning and how that feels for them. Um, and that this process is really collaborative. So like I said, if you have um, a goal that you're recognizing at home, bring that forward with that learning team. Um, at, at most schools I've worked at, we call it an SLT, that's the student learning team. And that's where everyone involved comes to the table. And um, if that table can be really big some days. If you ask the school for an SLT meeting, there could be 10 people at that table. And sometimes that can feel intimidating to think, you know, you're just one of 10, but amazing that 10 people showed up because they all care about your child and they all care about your child's success. And so this is really that collaborative process um, and that we really base this on a student's strengths. So every student has 
has strengths and has interests and has passions. And we really want to develop an IPP that leverages those. That's the most success that a student will find is when we know what their strengths are and that we can build on that with them. Um, something simple like my my child really loves games. They love to play games. I mean, what, what child doesn't? But if it's card games, dice games, all those things, we can develop strategies that it reinforce skills through those games. So anything you can think of around what they love to do is going to be important. And that this is a shared vision, so that this isn't the school doing something to you, for you, or at you. This is very much a team vision based on what you know. Again, we recognize this. Uh, parents know their children best. Um, teachers know the goals of the curriculum best. And so it's coming together to match those two things up and to develop a plan that meets in the middle. And that this is about strategy development. And this is such an important part of an IPP. And so, so often, and you may actually have one in your hands right now, an IPP says, uh, you know, so-and-so will read at this level. It'll say it reads at level F, for example. <laughs> if you have a young child, you've seen this. And yes, that is a goal that we want students to read at certain levels and we want their reading to progress through the years. But I would encourage you to really um, work with teachers to identify what strategies are going to move that child's reading forward. So is it a child's ability to look at the pictures in a book and predict what text is going to be because that's a really important skill in early reading. Is it the child's ability to sound out words and, and know what the sounds of letters make and the combinations of letters? And is that what's gonna move us forward? If we think numeracy, um, what is the strategy of, you know, how can we use these amazing, our, our hands to develop numeracy skills that our hands are a base 10 number system that match really nicely with our own base 10 number system and so what are the strategies that are going to move students forward not just what they'll do so not just what the end goal will be but what are we going to uh, do to get there and that the IPP focuses on independence our goal is always independence and how we can ensure that as we move students through this process from year to year that our, our goal is at the end of it they stand on their own merits and their own skills and that they feel the success of doing things on their own as much as possible with support from time to time. And we wanted to point out the importance of weighing wants with needs. And so sometimes in this process, we can want things to happen. And, and um, I think we've all experienced that in 2020. There's lots of things we want to happen. Um, and that sometimes those wants don't balance quite as well with our needs. And so we need to really focus on that balance and to find, uh, I talked earlier about funding and coding. The schools um, have a limited amount of funding and so we can't always get what we, what we really want, but that we have to focus on what the child really needs to successfully re-enter school and continue through school and um, proceed from there. Anything to add to it? No, and it just goes back to what, to what uh, Rachel was saying about the IPP, identifying really where the child is at and what is this next step and what does the child need to get to the next step. Um, and this is probably a very Rachel thing. So um, do you need any special equipment to help you study? And then the student says sparkly gel pens. And so um, my background is in technology for supporting students with exceptional needs. And so I, I do sort of, we're, we're in an age where we have access to a lot of tools and we sometimes don't think of their power. Something as simple as an iPhone in your as you're in your kid's pocket, you, it can kind of feel like, whoa, you know, that's a really expensive device to put in the hands of an eight-year-old. But it can be really powerful. We can put reminders in there to help organize their day. They can access tools and uh, even apps that can help with self-regulation and calming. Um, you can put in little time messages of, of encouragement and support so that they can continue to feel connected to you as they go to school because that is a big transition a lot of our kids have spent a lot of time with parents and with home and in a safety zone and now suddenly they're at school and so I 
I always want people to think of what are the tools we have at our disposal that can empower students to do things on their own. It's really common for kids to have phones in their pockets. Um, really common. I work at a school, it's like basically every student has a phone in their pocket. And so how can we use that phone to empower that independence that we're talking about? And it seems like a really simple tool, but it has a ton of power. So work with the school to make sure that we can leverage that with them. I just wanted to take a minute, and I won't do this for very long, we have a little video at the end here too, to talk about the different roles. So um, the teacher really is the designer of learning for your child, and so that is the person you're going to want to work closely with. Of course, as a child progresses in school, that, that teacher group gets bigger. There's often more than just one teacher involved. Um, I currently work at a high school, and there's probably four teachers. Um, that's okay. Feel free to email all of them, and they're designing the learning tasks, and they are evaluating and assessing your child. So um, keep that line of communication open and clear with them. Um, lots of times schools have a resource teacher. A resource teacher has multiple roles in a building. They may take your child for a small group or one-to-one -one instruction. They may oversee the entire IPP process. Um, they probably have a background that makes them an expert in some of those things. And so they may get involved. Again, I'm kind of explaining these 10 people that might show up at an SLT meeting just so that you don't feel overwhelmed when you get there. Um, ed, ed assistants, and we have a little video about them. Um, a, there's a, a lot of people really love ed assistants, and in education, we really love ed assistants. They, they play an important role in our classrooms. I think sometimes um, we view them as a second teacher, and they really have a different role, and so we just wanted to clarify that today. We have a video that follows up that'll, that talks a little bit about that. Um, and then there's a lot of other support staff in the school. There's people who greet the students at the buses. There's people who supervise in a lunchroom. There's people who, um, oh goodness, there's literally people of front office staff. All of these people um, play a role. And so if, for example, if you know that you might need to be called to the school to pick up a child who's feeling unwell, that's going to be the front office staff, perhaps. Um, perhaps your child has a new allergy that they didn't have before treatment, which is really common. That might be a lunchroom supervisor who needs to know that. Um, getting off the bus, there may be mobility issues. And so a bus supervisor may need to be aware of things. And so um, there's, there's just a lot of working parts. And those support staff, even though even they, they might only work at a school for three or four hours a day, can play a really important role in your child's day. Of course, there's administration, and um, we are the we like to call ourselves the instructional leaders of a building. And so, if you are working with the teacher, the teacher may bring in administration as a person who has lots of times more experience in schools and to, and perhaps a specialty that, that they can offer to that table. So really the if you if an assistant principal or a principal is called in the meeting, it's it's usually because they can offer a different level of expertise and the teacher um, is going to leverage that with them. And paraprofessionals. So schools have somewhat limited, but they do have access to psychologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and those professionals can play a role too. And, and from time to time, people from AHS can come into schools and work during the day because it works better. So those people can be involved too. So again, that table of 10 people is all these people who are showing up to support your child. Anything to add about that giant list, Joanne? No, no, it just gets bigger and bigger the more we talk about it. Sure. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. All right, so this next video is just really something to think about. It's just the role of an ed assistant. And I think Joanne, wanted, Joanne and I wanted to address this as a food for thought a little bit. It is um, really tempting and it's very common that people want an ed assistant to work one-to-one -one with their child all day. And I don't want to discount the importance of ed assistants because they play a crucial role in our schools, but to reframe what they do and their role in the, in the building and how they can support your child. So it's about five minutes. We'll just play the whole thing and afterwards we'll have time for questions. So you can be writing those down. Oh, why did it do that? Play. Over the past decade, the number of educational assistants working in Alberta schools has doubled. Many educational assistants are supporting students with disabilities. 
Under the direction of the teacher, an assistant can fulfill a variety of valued roles, depending on the classroom context and the needs of the students. Educational assistants offer crucial support that helps teachers and students alike. Completing clerical tasks, such as preparing learning materials, allows teachers to spend more time engaging with students. Supervising groups, such as on the playground, lunch programs, and busing, frees up planning time for teachers. An assistant enables the classroom teacher to spend focused time with small groups or individual students. EAs also enhance opportunities for supported practice by working with small groups or individual students to review concepts or new skills. With an assistant in the classroom, students with behavioral difficulties are monitored and supported more consistently. They can provide individualized behavior supports like positive reinforcement at key times or on-the-spot social skills coaching. Rearranging the physical environment so students feel more secure or are better able to focus. Some educational assistants provide physical support for students who need help with personal care or mobility. Busy teachers and concerned parents often appreciate having a second adult to provide another set of helpful hands, eyes, and ears in the classroom. Parents of children with disabilities sometimes request that an educational assistant be assigned to work one-to-one -one with their child because they believe this addresses their child's unique learning needs. As we learn more about inclusion, new information is emerging on the role and effectiveness of education assistance. Schools need to consider two key themes in the research. First, there is limited evidence of the effectiveness of one-to-one -one educational assistance as the primary support for students with disabilities. Second, there is extensive data on the unintentional effects of relying on one-to-one -one assistance, including unnecessary dependency on adults, isolation from classmates, inhibiting opportunities for choice and creativity, decreased engagement between the teacher and the student, as schools rethink ways to address student differences, they are rethinking how education assistance can best support teacher effectiveness and student success. For example, assistance can enable more flexible scheduling so teachers can work with small groups of students who need more support, provide follow-up instructional support for small groups of students. Only after other options have been examined by a student's learning team should one-to-one -one exclusive support be considered. Students need to move toward independence as they grow. Finding more natural ways to support students can help reduce unnecessary dependency on adults. Education assistants often sit close to a student. Simply moving away from the student's desk can be the first step to providing more natural supports. A student rarely needs side-by-side -side support all day, every day. Alternatives to side-by-side -side support can include walking around the room to support all students and checking in periodically with individual students, creating a written to-do list rather than providing verbal or physical prompts, looking for ways to make the learning task more manageable for the student to do on their own. Assistants can also ask students how they would like to be supported. During this activity, what do you need? When you get frustrated like that again, what can I do to help you? Working as a team, Teachers and educational assistants can look for opportunities to step back and start deliberately fading one-to-one -one adult assistance. Fading adult support includes looking for more natural supports to promote student independence and sense of control, including using technology, working with a peer, changing the task to better align with students' abilities. Reducing reliance on adult support can increase independence, interdependence, and interaction with peers. EAs can encourage and facilitate peer relationships, help students invite each other to socialize, create opportunities for students to work and learn together in natural and supportive ways. By rethinking the roles of educational assistants and linking research to practice, schools can make the best use of this valued resource and support students in natural and respectful ways that maximize their opportunities to learn and grow. For more information on supporting every student, visit the Alberta Education website. I think the biggest takeaway from, from that little video 
uh, for me at least, is the teacher is the teacher, the ed assistant is the assistant. Um, so the ed assistant shouldn't be teaching your children. They should be uh, supporting, uh, reinforcing teaching, doing some practice with kids, uh, as well as all the physical care, of course, that the teacher can't do. But basically, the ed assistant is um, an educational assistant to the, to the kids in the classroom and to the teacher. And as we finish, we wanted to point out this resource. I'm not sure it's going to let me... No, it's not going to let me click to the website and, of course, my computer. Oh, there we go. Oh, but now you can't see that. Um, so you can look this up, and we can have Nikki send the link to the group, too, um, that it's the uh, Coping When Your Child Has Cancer resource from the Canadian Cancer Society. I can share that screen when I leave this screen. I have limitations on this computer. but And I think... Or maybe at this stage. I think so. Okay. Who has questions? Nikki, what do you got? I'm going to yeah, stop sharing my screen so you can see our faces. Yay. You can see us. Um, so we do have a couple questions. So one of them, are EAs available from kindergarten all the way to grade 12? I believe the answer is yes. They definitely are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then the other one is um, there... There's no EA in um, one of her daughter's school, um, but there's a diversity learning teacher. What's the difference? So um, basically that's just a, a resource allocation decision the school has made and they've decided to hire a teacher who maybe has, they definitely have different uh, applications. So for example, a diversity learning teacher can take a small group of students and work on targeted instruction in a separate space and deliver a curriculum and plan for instruction. Whereas an ed assistant would stay in the classroom with the teacher who is currently delivering curriculum and planning for instruction and um, support that teacher's plan. So it's just a resource allocation based on what the school knows about their school population and the needs they're trying to address. Um, so it's just really, the teacher is maybe, I don't want to say more powerful, but they have a different set of skills and a different set of things that they can offer than an EA. Something to add, Joanne? No, that's, that's a perfect nutshell. Okay. Yeah. The, it's, a, it's a diversity learning uh, teacher. Uh, DLT role is typical in the um, in Calgary at least in the Calgary separate school board. Um, we don't have that in the, the, the in the public system. They yeah. probably just call it a resource, resource teacher. teacher. So yeah. it's it's a very similar. So it's really just a different title for the same person. They often don't have a specific teaching load. They don't likely have a class of their own. They're there to support teachers and students. Um, sometimes our, yeah, and sometimes our newer teachers and maybe encountering uh, learning difficulties that they haven't seen before. So a, di a diversity learning teacher can offer some of that professional development for teachers and some uh, support when teachers aren't sure how to proceed from time to time because um, teachers are really great and hardworking people, but they definitely haven't encountered every exceptionality throughout their careers and uh, they're always willing to learn new things. That's great. I, yeah, you seem to have answered it. So she's in the Catholic school board. Oh, there, I see a question. How does one go about creating an independent student while homeschooling? Ah, that's a great one. Um, can I take this one? This, this is one of my favorite things. And, it's, and so what I would always encourage, um, it's, it's sort of this resilience and problem solving thing that we're trying to foster with all students. So if a student, um, I'm going to give a math example because that's my passion. If a student has a question about how to do something in mathematics, a great way to encourage independence is to support them to, um, like, Google, how do I do this? And look for videos of people instructing. And then if they see one video, let's see if we can see two or three more videos that show different ways to do the same thing so that the student can say, oh, you know what? That way really makes sense to me. I can do that. So it's that independence of not sitting next to them and saying, okay, now do this next, do that next. It's how can I empower you to then go find those answers? Or even if they're working on a writing, they need to write a paragraph so that they write the first paragraph as independently as possible. And then maybe they sit with you to go through the writing. Maybe you read it aloud to them so they can hear it read aloud. And then you can they can make notes while you're reading aloud on things that they want to change about their writing. And so it's that sort of bounce back to 
you did this, now I support you to do the next steps, but it supports the independence that they then next time maybe could say, you know what, I could Google this, <laughs> or I could see a video about that, or I have a resource, I can call a friend who saw the lesson differently. And so it's all of that empowering them to make the next steps instead of stepping in and sitting alongside and saying, do this next, do that next. I hope that helps. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that because we're in a situation right now where a lot of kids are learning at home and that's that. It, that's not necessarily homeschooling. So there's the homeschooling piece where where parents are really on their own. But then there's the kind of the the kind of learning that kids are doing now when they're at home but still connected to their school. So don't forget that the homeroom teacher is still a resource to help. And the and the, and it's a really good skill for kids to learn how to ask for help of their teacher. Um, and so, and then the teacher would do exactly what, what uh, Rachel just said. But th there are two different circumstances about home learning right now, and there's different resources available depending on the situation. And, and depending on age and readiness, that self-advocacy of, um, you know, when, when can I ask a peer, how did you do this? When, when should I ask a teacher, how could I do this in the future? And when to seek that feedback from different circles. So I think all of those things breed independence in our current environment, which um, I like to joke that we're building this ship as we sail it, but we also don't know the weather. So um, it requires a ton of patience, but also um, it's a really exciting time that we're, we're developing so many skills in different groups of people. Does that answer? And, and so that yeah, so she's saying they're strictly online at home. Yeah, so through Price School, so that so there are still teachers at the school that you can reach out to ideally, and I would can you know to really work with your child to to decide when is it time to ask the teacher, when is it time to Google something, when is it time to maybe ask a peer, and to that's a really important skill even as an adult knowing when to ask for help and who to ask for help, and so to really to have those conversations with students to say, oh, I wonder who we should ask and to start talking through and over time they'll build the skill to make that decision on their own and it's really empowering as a child to to know who to ask and when to ask. I think that the, in my experience as a teacher, especially as a math teacher, the, um, the students who struggle most are the ones who are too afraid to ask a question and so um, it's really empowering to have them know that they can ask a question that it's not a reflection of anything, but I need help with things. Um, a question from Karen. I've heard some parents express concern over having their child coded impacting long-term and post-secondary. Oh goodness, have you heard of any disadvantages? It's actually quite the opposite. So um, one of the best things about having an educational code is that it carries through right through to post-secondary access. So if your child has always used a um, speech to text, for example, tool to write essays, so they speak into a computer and the computer types it out for them and then they edit from there, um, they can access that right through to post-secondary. There are assistive um, offices in every post-secondary institution in Alberta and a student with a code accesses that everywhere. Um, we're moving more towards universal supports and universal accommodation. For example, on all of our major exams in Alberta, every student gets double, double exam time. Um, if your child's always access double exam time because of processing or things like that, they can definitely access that in post-secondary. That code really helps just justify and back that up. Yeah, there's there's no there's no reason for a code to limit the future of a child. It really does outline. It it, it doesn't label a child, but it, what it does is alert the educators around them to know that they need some kinds of accommodations to help them learn. And so it's not a it's not a barrier to learning. It's a it's a bridge to learning. Oh, and by the way, codes don't go into um, uh, into university. Like the coding system is, is about the great uh, K to 12 process, but all of those accommodations and as Rachel said, that, that they've lived with and benefit from then can still be uh, accessed later. And that educational assessment can be shared at that level with the, those offices to say, you know, I've always accessed this accommodation because of this um, exceptionality and um, I'd like to access it here and the schools as far as I've always known, they've, they're really great about it. So, all right. No other questions? Yeah, I can free. talk faster than I can write, so I'll ask this question. Um, any comments you would make about 
uh, some children who really don't want anybody to know about their cancer diagnosis and um, are very resistant to telling teachers, their peers, that kind of thing. Any, any comments about working with a child like that? I've heard that with young, a couple of young kids and I've heard that with um, some, some older kids as well. That's a tough one. Yeah, it is. I would say that um, as a parent, that's probably going to be um, definitely in, in the parent's wheelhouse that they know their child best. I would say that um, this diagnosis has an extreme impact on education, even if treatment can be really managed without a lot of missed school. Um, but that, you know, if we don't share that information, school is going to be harder. So that's how I would frame that for, for students is that this is being done to help you, just like medicines are done to help and um, testing is done to help. And so that, you know, sharing with the school, the school doesn't need to acknowledge that. So you can tell a teacher or an administrator without that teacher ever speaking to the child about it. So sometimes that's the fear is that if people are gonna ask me questions and it's gonna become part of my identity at school. So the school can know, and you can know the school knows, but and the child can know that the school knows, but we can put some really strong boundaries around how that's addressed at school and whether or not the teacher would even talk to the child about it until the child is ready. Um, but I would say that keeping that information from the school wouldn't be advantageous and that we would need to frame this for the child so that they feel safe that the school knows, but also that the school knows so that they can continue working with the child. So in that case, encourage the parent to make contact with someone at the school to discuss that uh, being a primary issue and uh, trying to figure out ways to, to move through that. And I would say that um, probably the, the person who's most empowered at the school at that stage is an administrator. Um, the administrator can decide when is the right time. Um, early on might not be the right time. It does If it doesn't impact the teachers, it can just say that the student is going to have an extended absence. We'll fill you in later um, to respect the child's wishes. Um, it does, that the administrators are probably the most empowered to make that decision at the right time and make sure the right people know in the right moment. Um, sometimes teachers with 30 students in the room can be a little overwhelmed by that information, especially if it needs to be handled delicately. And it's not that they wouldn't, but it's that they they have a different focus in terms of what they're doing day to day. Great. I would just reinforce everything that Rachel said. Um, uh, to me, uh, to me, a child that is feeling like that has probably got some real some real emotional issues regarding their diagnosis and that would be that would be the biggest thing to deal with from a family perspective um, and maybe counseling or whatever is required in that situation to help self-esteem um, to help self-acceptance that kind of thing um, i mean i most kids as i said earlier don't want to be sort of the center of attention uh, and and be treated differently but uh, when there is something that impacts them so greatly, I, I really do think it really does need to be dealt with sort of at the family level. And that would likely be um, parents going back into the hospital setting to seek some support? Um, I think that would be a good place. There are medical psychologists at the hospital um, that are there specifically to deal with those kinds of issues for kids who've got medical issues who are being affected emotionally by those medical issues. In other words, harder to find that kind of support within the school system uh, yes. than to go back to the hospital? Yeah, the school system um, wouldn't have the best frame of reference for that. So we do have psychologists. Um, two things, they're difficult to get on board just because they're busy and um, there's just not enough of them, there never are. And also those psychologists um, don't work in that realm of, of supporting kids through medical diagnosis, where the ones at the hospital, really, that is their specialty, and that's what they can address specifically. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that aspect of things is better dealt. Now, long term, a student may have some, some real mental health concerns with having you know this diagnosis and the latent effects and things like that that may be a time to seek the support of a school psychologist who can sort of work with the student around learning in a new context or in the long-term context but in that initial we're telling the school and a child is hesitant I think that would be the hospital for sure yeah there's there's they've got two different roles there's the medical psychology and there's the educational psychology 
And so the educational psychologists in the context of most school systems don't have the capacity in terms of time um, to do actual counseling. And uh, that's what the medical psychologists at the hospital are there for. Okay. Yeah. No other questions. I've got a couple more. <laughs> and that's, uh, I want to make sure parents get in there. Any parents? There's nothing You're, in the chat yet. Go ahead, Karen. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, feel free to step in. Um, I, one is a comment. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about a program that Kids Cancer Care has to support um, kids in the school setting. That's called Cancer in the Classroom. And that program is done by our child life specialist. Um, she is broadening that program into the junior high high schools, uh, if possible, if, if, if a family thinks it would be worthwhile. Um, so you would meet um, with the child life specialist and um, discuss what that might look like in the child's school. Essentially, uh, she would go into the child's classroom or classrooms. Sometimes uh, she's, uh, they've done it in a um, small junior high and done it to a broad school base, but talk about cancer. Um, uh, what is it? What is this student going through? Or they can keep it more generic if a child is really uncomfortable about um, them talking about the child specifically. But uh, some of the myths around cancer, that it's not contagious, some of those different aspects, really whatever it is a family thinks would be supportive for the school community to know um, around cancer. So um, that's done by our child life specialist currently is Kim. So uh, we hope some parents will take advantage of that. That's why, that's why I wanted to mention that, Karen. And I, I didn't I didn't go as far as to mention your tutoring program, but but I, I'm I'm hoping and assuming that most of your parents are aware of that uh, resource through your agency as well. Yeah, we've we've uh, we're moving into what the fourth or fifth year, um, fourth year. We're we're we keep it fairly quiet because it's been difficult with the amount of staffing we've had available to accommodate uh, as many. Uh, kids that we have, um, there, there is a wait list. However, we've had some more th staffing thrown into that program and it may even hopefully increase more so um, because we can do that. We can continue with that program online. So um, yeah, we've, it's, it's still going and growing. Perfect. And just a note on that, if you do have a tutor, um, it is really great when the tutor can communicate with the school, especially with the teacher. There's usually some forms that um, need to be filled out at the school's end. So just a reminder to parents, if you have a tutor and you want them to speak to the teacher, um, there's forms in, in both districts, in Calgary at least, that you can fill out that would allow the teacher to speak with the tutor and uh, talk about specific things that they're seeing and specific skills and strategies that they want developed for the classrooms. They're called consent forms for disclosure. Yeah, obtain and release forms, yes. <laughs> That's great to know. I just wanted to add that, add to that actually. So the Cancer in the Classroom program that Karen just spoke about, uh, led by Kim, so it's also virtual. Um, so we've been able to do that since September. So that's kind of, that's pretty neat. Um, and it can be done just for the classroom of the child or if they, they want the whole school involved, they can do that as well. So um, that's kind of another piece to cancer in the classroom that has gone well for 2020. Um, and then when your child, yeah, when your child is getting tutored by a tutor within Kids Cancer Care, mm -hmm. so I have a three-year-old in front of me right now. Um, it would be great to have them involved in that big support, you know, roundtable kind of discussion because they are, we've just upped the tutor hours to two hours instead of one hour a week. So they can tutor uh, and be with your kid for two hours virtually. Um, it's kind of saving them um, from driving to the house or the library where they were meeting them before. So now that they can up their hours, um, it, let's get, it would be great to get them more involved. So yeah, I didn't know about the form. So that's great to know Rachel and Joanne. Um, to have a form filled out by the school. Some of the um, takeaways, uh, just to kind of put your whole presentation in, in a nutshell um, from my end, and then if you have any additional questions, some, another question kind of sparks um, a question to be asked, just post it in the chat box. But the partnership with the school, um, just like your medical team, is so important. Uh, that collaboration piece and advocating 
um, so important. And sharing diagnosis and treatment plan right away when you know. Um, if you are kind of shy about it and only want to do this after, then, then that's totally up to you and your family. The re-entry plan, um, very important, and the effects of the medication. Um, we even tell our tutors as well the effects of the medication or if they had chemo that day and they're extremely tired. These are important things to mention also to the tutor. So I can see how important it is to mention to the teacher. Um, celebrate those mini successes. I love that you said that, Rachel. Uh, share assessments with the school. Having a team to create the ITP uh, and create the actual strategies to put in place. Those are all really important. Um, and I love that you said the iPhone is super handy. They all have it in their pocket. So let's use it as reminders. It's almost like, oh my gosh, I should get my five-year-old one. Just a reminder <laughs> when to get changed in the morning. You know, it's like the little, the little pieces. Um, this is 2020. This is what we need to be aware of that technology is, it, let's make use of it. Um, um, so th that's great. And then the role of the education assistants, just, it's a great video. Um, and I'm glad you saw it and I will attach it into the email to everyone as well after so you can rewatch it if you'd like. Any other questions that kind of sparked something? My kid's choking, he's okay though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the heat just turned on in my office so it's like sweltering in here all of a sudden and it was cold all morning so great. <laughs> Think I'm starved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was honestly, it was great um, for me as well to listen to you, Rachel and Joanne, speak from uh, educators' uh, perspective. Um, I hope it uh, was great for you, parents and tutors. I hope you learned something from that. Um, oh, we have one more question. I, I just read that question too. So it's a it's a suggestion that a student would just focus on math um, due, due to an amount of absence and says the rest of the subjects can get caught up later. Is that true? And um, and I'm not just being a math teacher when I say this, but it is it is pretty true. I'll explain why. So um, math is a building block curriculum, and uh, which means that if you miss a block along the way, none of the rest of the wall is going to be quite as strong. And so if a student is going to be away for a really long time, we do suggest that they keep up with math, whereas a lot of our other curriculums do what we call is uh, they spiral. So they, they revisit concepts throughout the years and they just kind of start to spiral up. If you think of science, for example, we talk about ecosystems in grade five and we do them again in grade seven and we do address it again in grade nine and we just add complexity and layers each time. And lots of times when we add that complexity in layers, we revisit the foundational concepts. In math, those that revisiting is much briefer because there's just more discrete outcomes and um, we build much quicker just based on previous things. So I, I think that's a great suggestion. And um, I know it can be a little scary to say we're going to let go of the rest. You don't really have to. I mean, we're. I always the number one indicator of student success long term is how much they read. And so I would say if you keep up with reading, whether it's you read together, it's a read aloud, even listening to audiobooks while you have the book in front of you, and then keep up with math, um, social studies and science, we can catch up later on those things. And you can even just talk a little bit about science. Um, I would argue that the hospital is a very scientific place to just even talk about what they're seeing, and what they're feeling, um, and how that's related to science throughout their day. They're talking to nurses, they're talking to doctors. Um, lots of times our kids at KCC know more about science and medicine than other students. It maybe isn't curriculum based, but it's still important in yeah. terms of talking about how science works and, and how that even works in their lives. Um, the, the fact that medicines are developed over time and that's all great stuff that these students know about and that is what we're teaching in the classroom. And so yeah, it says if she has the energy to add more subs, sub, which one should add on next? I would say reading and writing. So um, if she has more energy or even if you can make writing a part of you know, journaling her experience, um, in, if we're using technology, she could make um, like a video, a vlog even of her experience. I think that's important to validate what she's going through when she's older to look back at her experience. Um, I, you don't know the number of kids that I meet at KCC through camp who when I ask them, you know, they start talking about their experience. They're like, I don't really remember it, which is amazing. But it's uh, also, I also, it would be neat as, as they're going through it. And that would be an English outcome that they can speak about their experience. They can do it in a video. They can talk about, you know, 
things that are happening even in the world during the time and, and stuff like that. So I would add on that layer of, of literacy, reading, writing, speaking, communicating, in addition to math, uh, science and social studies can be caught up easily later. Yeah, but the literacy piece is, numeracy and literacy are the two cores of, of uh, education uh, going forward in terms of the academics. And so I just, Double. Double what you say twice over. <laughs> Truthfully, anytime, even even right now during the pandemic, I think that if you're struggling with, you know, what to get done and where, um, I think this holds true. And it's not just because I'm a math teacher. I always need to preface that. Um, this holds true at a tough time. Even in the spring, my advice to teachers was uh, let's let's stick to foundational math concepts that we know they're going to need moving forward. Um, not that science and social studies aren't important, but the, the structure of the curriculum is different. And it allows different flexibility moving forward. So. Right. And the basis, the basis of social and science, uh, social and science curriculums, and all the other related curriculums is literacy. Yeah. And there's a lot of math in there as well, just in terms of the science. Yeah. So if you're a competent reader and you have really great reading comprehension, social studies is going to be easier, for example, and so is science. Yeah. And so again, it's that foundation of of reading together, talking about what we read, talking about what we understood about what we read, <laughs> and all of those things. I just can't stress that enough at home. If you, if, like yeah. the, if you're reading with your child, you've already put them yeah. leaps and bounds ahead. And that's for every child across the board, starting very young. There's just no, no substitute for that kind of early literacy stuff with kids. It doesn't look like literacy, but it is. And the communication piece and the talking and the making of making assumptions based on what you read all of that stuff comes so naturally uh, and we kind of forget about it sometimes but it's it is the building block for future so, so can the tutor help with that medical life journal with the child i think that's a great idea i think that's a great activity for the tutor to do with the child even in terms of just the technical expertise it might take to edit the video or to record sound um i think that that's a really neat uh, bonding thing for a tutor to work on with the child and to get some perspective um the, the most fascinating thing about our kids at kcc is that this is normal to them they don't know necessarily that every other child's experience isn't this and it, it could be years sometimes especially for our wee little kids that they don't know that this that every kid didn't go to the hospital or experience this at some point and um and it can be really powerful for a tutor to to see that and feel that that it's this is all very factual for a lot of our our kids especially the wee little ones they can talk about it really factually and it's really fascinating and I think it would be neat for our tutors to see that and be play a role in the technical expertise. And um, especially Karen and Nikki have done such a great job of finding these young, energetic tutors. <laughs> they're in university and they're such go-getters. So it'd be really neat to see some of the technical things that they could lend in this environment. And also in the summer, we often ask uh, our tutors to do that. So there's no curriculum to follow or maybe homework to do kind of during the summer. And so we often refer back to that and say, you know what, let's just do read alouds, um, especially in those younger kids. Let's do read alouds. That's so important just to hear somebody um, reading to them and journal, journal what you did on the weekend. You went camping with your family. Let's create a journal about it. Draw pictures with it. Um, put some craft in there as well or make a video and that sort of thing. So that ties in with ELA. Um, so I'm just answering a couple of private questions in the chat too. Um, but yes, for sure, the tutors, um, that's what they're there for. Karen said we have a couple of great tutors who are retirees too. Oh goodness, in education, we lean pretty heavily on our educational retirees. So our, our building is held together by a few um, retired teachers who sub for us exclusively right now. And uh, in pandemic times, it's been amazing to have people who, um, the great thing about retired teachers sitting next to one is that um, they, they come in and they hit the ground running. And, and I love both ends of that spectrum, a new teacher with all of that energy and optimism <laughs> balanced with a retiree who, who just knows the ropes and they can come in and, and step into pretty much any situation. So we're pretty lucky on both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. And if you do, if you are a family without a tutor right now and you're listening to this presentation and you are thinking of joining and wanting a tutor for your kid, just let us know, you know, we could do anything from male to female to young to in med school, uh, you know, 
subject matter, what they specialize in, what their expertise is in. Um, we do uh, try and match within your community as well. And so we take all those things into consideration to make sure you have just the best person um, by your side to help you out with school. Any other questions here? We're thankful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, what else do we see? Thank you, Joanna, Rachel. Yeah. It also, it's, it's true. There's such a bond between the tutors and the learners as well, which is, um, it's nice. And it's also another person for the kid kind of to look up to other than their parent. Um, I, I joked my whole career that the parent student um, math dynamic can can be can break down relationships pretty quickly. And, um, and you, can hear it, you can often hear the tutor at the kitchen table with your kid and you're like, that's what I said yesterday. And um, but they're listening differently to a tutor. And it's just sometimes that that extra voice um, and even a family member as as the family resident math expert um sometimes my sister will say i think i explained that to her exactly the same way yesterday i'm like i don't know it's just different when i say it somehow <laughs> so anytime a new voice can can lend expertise um it's it's not about you or the way you said it sometimes it's just about the way it lands and totally and probably hard to accept too from some parents what do you mean? Yeah. Good in math. Why aren't they listening to me? Totally. And there's like a whole ego thing with helping our own kids with work. And uh, we okay. sometimes have to let that set to set aside and do whatever works and not worry about the fact that it wasn't you that time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the whole emotional thing within family, you know, family dynamics and bonds between parents and things. They're not, you're not, as a parent, I, I've gone through this myself, you're not always the best teacher for your child. Even though you know your child the best, you're not always the best teacher for each other. Just like trying to learn something from your spouse. So um, <laughs> I don't know if you've tried that lately, but uh, give it a try and then you'll remember what it feels like to for your kids sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think I let my spouse try to teach me how to do bike maintenance and I think it ended with me in the basement and him just finishing up the bike maintenance. <laughs> totally. You win the coffee shop. Him and the yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. That was um, wonderful. There's a lot of thank yous in the chat as well, privately and to everyone. Um, so your insight and your expertise is amazing. And I hope we can reach out to you. Um, they are on our committee, so I can definitely reach out to them at any time and ask them additional questions. So if you do have questions, let me know. Um, oh. oh, I'll suggest to do boredom. <laughs> Oh, my, I'm a crafter. And as a kid, I was a crafter. And, and I just think crafts, um, especially if you can get them interested in something that, um, that takes an extended period of time, <laughs> even something, you know, um, I, I learned how to knit when I was little. And um, that was a great, it, it passes the time, but you're also making something. Um, I really value crafting for the aspect that sometimes in life, and especially I think in a in a diagnosis, there, it feels like there's no finishing to things. Um, you you just work and work and work, but then there's just the next thing. And crafting has an end. It has a, I made a thing. And it can also be gifted and it can also be worn or enjoyed. And so um, that's me. That's just my, I don't think it's a professional opinion, but um, crafting has been my respite from a lot of things over the years. And I would agree because it's also a learning there's a lot of craft, no matter what you're doing, there's a lot of eye-hand coordination. There's a lot of skill building in crafting uh, and just as a, as a side effect. And uh, that's always helped. And the fine motor, which um, a lot of our kids need to kind of build up again or the, and some gross motor. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely. And, and then you balance that with activity as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there's physical, there's also, depending on the capacity, but, you know, just I'm doing... I, like I'm an outdoor person, crafting always drove me crazy. <laughs> so, so, but getting out and, you know, I mean, even just tending plants in the house or uh, just taking on some responsibilities like that, that is, again, related to growth, relating to something, something alive and something meaningful. Um, the plant grows, hopefully it doesn't die, or getting outside and, and doing physical things outside, learning a, learning a, you know, a, a dribbling skill in the backyard for when you can get back to your soccer team, things like that. Um, that just sort of balances all of the physical and emotional and 
um, the need to not do academics all the time. Yeah, and opening um, that door to a whole bunch of activities. Just yeah. Open it to see what your, your kid follows. And maybe not everyone's up for pets, but I also I um I've also really always valued my relationship with with animals and with a pet. So a special a special relationship um, with uh, even if it's a fish for real. Um, it's it's always been important to me throughout my lifetime. Um, right to this day that my my dog is my best pal and uh, it's provides a lot of sanity. So exactly, there's the, that relationship, but there's also that dependence. Um, that you're taking care of something, and there's responsibility, and and, and resp uh, that kind of development comes with taking care of pets, and and yeah, I'm not saying go out and like get a cat tomorrow, but I'm not not saying that either. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. all have cats tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, and Charmaine, Charmaine, that's exactly it. The the snow is out there, so enjoy those yeah. outdoors. Do stuff yeah. with snow. Throw snowballs at the fence. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff to do. Practice like tie dyeing fabric, and again, this is all stuff you can learn right now on the internet. Um, like tie dyeing is this huge trend. Like, give it a try. It might look ugly the first three times, but um, it is just fun for them to experiment. And then we're back to curriculum. That is art and science and yeah. and all of those exploration things. And so everything is just we're moving forward with learning. So.